So I'll start off by saying there are 30 to 70 trillion cells in your body. 30 to 70 trillion cells. And each one of those different cells has a different shape. Some of those shapes are beautiful and complex, like those cells on the screen there. Truly, the human body and all these 30 to 70 trillion shapes represents order in this chaotic universe. And each one of those different shapes allows cells to do something different. The shape of a muscle cell allows muscle cells to lift. The shape of your brain cells allows you to think. The shape of your heart allows cells to beat. And the shape of blood allows it to flow through the body. But shape of the cells is also not just allowing cells to do certain things. I think it's telling us something about our own health and our disease. And I think if we can learn the language of cells, we can learn what they're telling us through cell shape, we can better diagnose and treat cancers. Because it's one in three of us, if not one in two of us in this room, are going to get cancer in our lifetimes. Most of the time, it will look like a mass of cells growing somewhere in your body, millions and millions of cells, in addition to the trillion you already have, growing somewhere as a mass, as a lump. Now, the good news is that for 50% of patients, you'll survive for 10 years or longer, and many patients will be completely cured of the disease within their lifetimes. The reason we're doing well at the war in cancer, against cancer is because over the last half century or so, We've developed better surgery. We've developed better chemotherapy. We've developed better radiotherapy. And we have exciting new treatments such as immunotherapy that allow us to kill and remove cancer cells in much more sophisticated ways than we had before. And in fact, over the last 40 years, survival rates in this country have doubled. Unfortunately, treatment still fails for 50% of patients. Why does treatment fail for half but works so well for others. And for some cancers, it's, the statistics are quite, in fact, more, much more dire. We're not doing very well against pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer. Very few of those patients will, in fact, survive very long at all. We need to do better at both diagnosing and treating cancers. Now, the reason why some fail and why some work, why some treatments are good, why some don't, is because not only is each patient's tumor different, not only is each cancer different, but each cell in that tumor is different. There's millions and millions of cells in those tumors, and each one of them is different in a certain way. So they'll respond differently to treatment. Let's imagine we have a tumor, it's comprised of many cells, and you start attacking those cells with a treatment that will work. Many of those cells will die. That's the good news. But a few might survive, and a few might resist that therapy, and the therapy won't work at all. Those cells might start to grow and proliferate. Eventually, they'll repopulate the tumor, and the patient will be left with a tumor that's impossible to treat now because you don't have a therapy available to kill those resistant cancer cells. This is why many of those patients, 50% of cancer patients, for, that cancer therapy is not working because there's therapeutically resistant cells sitting in those tumors that we can't seem to kill. Now, as a way to circumvent this resistance, to overcome it, for the last few decades, we've been using something called combination therapy, where instead of targeting one type of cancer cell with one type of drug, you can target another type of cancer cell with another kind of drug at the same time. You essentially are combining therapies, and that seems to limit the problem of resistance very effectively in some patients. Why this doesn't work sometimes is not that the therapy itself doesn't work, it's because we don't know the right combination. So I've told you, we have all these great new therapies, all these great new drugs, all these great new small molecules that clinicians have to choose from. The challenge a clinician faces is picking the right combination. How do you pick the combination that's going to work? How do you know that for, when, for that patient, with that tumor, with that cancer, with all their particular unique cancer cells, how do they know the right combination to find? It's a very difficult problem. Not only do they have to find the right one, they have to find, for example, one that's going to limit toxicity. The more drugs you give a patient, the more sick they're going to get during the treatment itself. We want to limit side effects. And also, it's important to realize that combination therapy in particular is very expensive. There's a revolutionary new therapy on the market, anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 therapy. It works for some patients, but it's also the same price as a house in this country. 
and we don't want to give this therapy to a patient if it's not going to work. That just doesn't make any financial sense. It doesn't make any sense at all, in fact. So we have to come up with better ways to diagnose patients on a single cell level. We have to look at each patient's tumor and on a single cell level, for each of those individual million cells, decide which one's going to be sensitive to drug, which one's going to be resistant to drug. And if we understand that, we should be able to come up with better therapies. We should be able to know the exact combination to give to certain patients if we know what every cell will do if we give a specific combination of drugs. So we need to diagnose cancers on a single cell level, and that is not happening right now, because we don't really have the technology available to diagnose cancers on a single cell level in the clinic. But only if we do this, only if we can diagnose cancer on a single cell level, can we really tailor patient therapy to each individual patient and each individual cancer. So I think we have a way to do this, to diagnose cancer on a single cell level, and that's by looking at cell shape. And this has come from the last 15 years of work or so I've been doing in the lab, where essentially what I do every day, and probably most of the night, is look down microscopes. Some of these microscopes might be very simple, and some of them might be the most technologically advanced machines on the planet. I look at cells, and I look at their cell shape. And one thing I've noticed, and I think you're going to notice it in the next slide, is that cells, normal cells, have different shape than cancer cells. Even you're going to be able to see the difference. You're not a cell biologist, at least most of you aren't, but you're going to see the difference. In these cells, on the left are normal cells. These are not cancerous cells. They're square, you might say. They're spread. They're flat. They're kind of packed together in a honeycomb structure. On your right are cancer cells. I think you can see and agree with me that they have a different shape. They're smaller, they're thinner, they're rounder, they have these tails, some of them have fingers, they have little bumps on them that, cancer, that the normal cells don't have. All cancer cells have different shapes than normal cells, and those differences in shapes are a great starting point to have a diagnostic on a single cell level. Now, one thing we need to be able to do is find these cells in very complicated images in patient tumors. And so I was giving you a simple example before, but this is what a cells look like in a patient tumor. <laughs> this is a, just a small section of a tumor, and in those cells are cancer cells. There's also normal cells. There's immune cells. There's all sorts of different cells in there. How do we find the cancer cells? I've been doing this for a long time, and if I stared at this image long enough, I could probably find the cancer cells. And if I stared at it longer and I sat there, I could probably tell you the shape of the cancer cells. But I bet you can't do that right now. You can't do it if you sat here long enough, trust me. It's a little bit like looking through another complicated type of picture and trying to find one little aspect of it, you know, trying to find Wally in this picture here. We all could do it if we sat here long enough, if we all got trained well enough, but it's gonna take some time and we all couldn't do it accurately. And if we have hundreds of thousands of patient samples to go through, there's no way we could all sit and do this together in an accurate, rapid, fast way. It doesn't make sense. So to find cells and describe their shape in a very fast way, 10 years ago, I invented a computer program where I was working with the laboratory of George Church at Harvard Medical School. And what this computer program does is it can find cells and describe their shape in very fast ways. So we can feed the computer my images we take from the microscopes, simple microscopes or complicated microscopes. We can then, the computer then recognizes individual cells and then from each individual cell makes hundreds of different measurements about that cell's shape and each cell is assigned a fingerprint, or what we call a signature, about that cell's shape. So these programs that we use to find cells and describe their shape work very similar to image analysis programs they use to find people on CCTV footage, facial recognition programs to find people that are quickly going through a subway station, for example. It's very same kind of computation going on behind, from finding, behind finding people and finding cells. And once we start, we find cells and describe their shape, we can do something else. What we can do then is feed them into a second series of models that my team has invented. These models do something else. They're decoders. They translate cell shape for us. They can say, for example, if a cancer cell is cancerous or not. Is, for example, what type of cancer did that cell come from based on its shape? If we see a cell of that shape in a patient, we can tell how long that patient will live. There's truly a lot of predictive power to cell shape if we just have the right imaging and the right decoding. And what we're working on now is models, mathematical models, that tell us which drug would be best to use based on the shape of that cell. I'm just gonna tell you just a little bit about how those models work because I think it's important. 
What we do to construct these models is we use data that's generated from my own lab, but we also integrate it from data that's available around the world, Ge data generated by hundreds of labs around the world. This is called big data integration. I'm sure some of you have already heard about this. And what this big data integration allows us to do is create these models and allows us to go from point A to point B, from cell shapes to genes, that's the kind of data we generate in my lab, from genes to patients, somebody else might have generated that, from patient data to drugs, and then eventually make the connection between drugs and cell shapes. So these models look a lot like maps, transit maps. They tell us how to go from point A to point B, how we can take our cell shape with a particular form can be treated with a drug. And they're kind of decoders for cell shape language. And we hope to use now these two technologies to really diagnose patient on a single cell level. Now we have computers which can go in and find single cells on very complicated images. Computers can do things to the, and see cells that we cannot see, that human beings can't find. They can make descriptions of cell shape very fast. And using our second series of mathematical models, we can go in and predict what cells will be sensitive to drugs, which cells will be resistant to drugs. And now we can make very complicated, sophisticated, personalized therapies. And I think this is really gonna impact how we diagnose and treat cancer patients in the real near term. Now, as we've been doing this work, I've been thinking, if one cell shape can tell us so much, if we can predict how long a patient will live by the shape of those cells in that patient, what does, for example, 17 trillion cells shape tell us? What does the shape of our bodies tell us about our health and disease? What does the shape of our face tell us? Could we predict our cancer from the shape of my face or the shape of my limbs? It sounds a little bit like science fiction. Maybe it is. But thankfully, there's a few of us working on there to make this science fiction reality. So for example, George Church at the Personal Genome Project is collecting from different people not only their sequence data, but also health records. And for each person that gets sequenced and submits health records, they also submit an image of their face. And the idea is that we could use image recognition software to identify and match facial features to patient records. And in fact, people in the UK have already done this. They've used facial recognition software to diagnose genetic disorders based on the shape of people's faces. This is a long way from diagnosing cancer based on the shape of people's faces. But I really think there's a lot of information in single cell shape and also in the shape of our bodies. And we just have to have better imaging, for example, to get at this. So we need better microscopes. I always need a better microscope. So better microscopes to give us higher resolution, to do it faster, to look deeper into the cell, but also to get more cells at one time. We need better ways to analyze these images. And I'm super excited about deep learning approaches, which I'm sure many of you've heard, that allow computers to really make very sophisticated and rapid analyses of complex images. And we also need more data to build better models, to build better decoders. And the more data that I can kind of get from the internet that other labs produce, that we can integrate and bring into these models, the better our models become, the more predictive power we will have. And so I really think by looking at cell shape, diagnosing it, and giving patients a much more personalized diagnosis, clinicians will be able to better pick the right therapy for each individual patient, and we will better, uh, we'll better treat patients, and we will certainly improve the lifespan of that remaining 50% of cancer patients that desperately need help. Thanks very much.